and welcome back to the last session of the Working International Conference Day on Museum Sustain Sustainability. We're now going to hear from three early career professionals who will discuss what developing positive change within the museum sector can look like. Um, I'd like to welcome and hand over to uh, Chloe, Izzy and Kate. Hello, thank you Christian for that and I hope everyone viewing isn't too tired from the second day of the conference um, and good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us today to listen to the future voices of the museum sector. During the next hour you are going to hear from myself, Chloe Bell, Izzy McLeod and Kate Ruff and gain an insight into our experience as early career professionals and our views on what developing positive change within the museum sector can look like. We all have varied experience and are really excited to be sharing our thoughts with you today. Throughout this session, there is an option of closed captioning and fingers crossed technology will be our friend for the next hour. Any issues, please pop it in the chat. There is someone who can assist with that. So this afternoon, I will share my experience and thoughts and then I will pass over to Izzy who will pass over to Kate, who will more thoroughly introduce themselves and share their experience and hopes for the future. After we've all shared, Izzy is going to chair a Q&A. So please use the Q&A function um, throughout the talk so we can pick those up later on. So to begin, my name is Chloe Bell and I'm currently the Senior Gallery Assistant at Rugby Art Gallery Museum based in the Midlands. Within this institution, I've driven a fantastic move forwards to becoming more environmentally conscious, starting with reducing daily admin paper wastage, doing so whilst of course ensuring any employees and visitors who do need paper-based communication still have the resources required. I'm a strong believer that small things make a big difference and you always have to start somewhere. These small steps and having a team around me who feed off proactivity and are also passionate towards making our institution a more sustainable venue has driven me to look further into how museums and galleries are functioning. If they are successfully responding to the challenges presented by the climate crisis, and if they are making adequate changes to become more resourceful and sustainable. So there are three main factors I started looking into, the three main areas of sustainability. So there's the society, sustaining and improving inclusivity, and ensuring stakeholders and fundings come from an honest place. There's the environmental, so curation waste using contemporary artists who practice sustainably and looking at how collections are stored. And then finally, there's the economic, so generating sustainable income for the community and use influences from the international research that is constantly being done. So if I did want to speak about all of these, I'm sure I could have filled the whole three days of the conference. And frankly, I'm sure you all don't want to listen to me for three days. And um, I don't really want to do that either. <laughs> so I've been focusing on the environmental side of sustainability and museums which are currently doing that and how they can do more to become sustainably conscious. Within this, I'm going to cover galleries focusing, focusing on sustainability, curation wastage, and what galleries can do to improve. And then I'll go into um, just a couple of examples of how artists are practicing sustainably. So galleries focusing on sustainability, there are some really great examples of UK galleries and partnerships who are pioneering sustainable initiatives. So these are Creative Carbon Scotland, the National Museum Wales and Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum. Creative Carbon, Car bleh, Creative Carbon Scotland is an organisation who started in 2011 with environmental sustainability at its heart and a drive and focus to help art institutions report their carbon emissions. They have progressed to now explore the sector's role in transforming how we drive change, not only as museum workers, but as a society. They currently support nearly 120 key organisations in mandatory carbon reporting to Creative Scotland, whilst also working with Creative Scotland themselves to support all the organisations who Creative Scotland work with. The National Museum Wales 
are among are aiming to develop sustainable practice in the operation of their seven museums and promote sustainable living through their events and learning programs and no doubt later on in the talk Izzy and Kate will both go into this in more detail. Finally, Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum have successfully achieved a gold award from Visit Scotland's Green Tourism Scheme. This award assesses energy and water efficiency, waste management, biodiversity, and more categories, which is marked extremely rigorously. This award shows the dedication the institution has to change and shows to their community that they care and are on a path for a sustainable future. Of course, there are many more museums who are putting in effort and a proactive change. And there are, as soon as museums reopen, I strongly suggest you all go to your local museums, have a look, see what they're doing and just have a conversation with them. And please, of course, be a sustainable visitor. So moving on to curation waste and what galleries can do to improve, there is a huge issue with institutions building structures to exhibit specific art, um, whether this be work that has been given to them on loan, if it's in their collection, or even sometimes additional structures for touring exhibitions. The trouble is many don't have the storage space for these structures once they are done with the exhibition. So, materials like timber and fabrics go to waste. It's extremely possible to build partnerships with the institution's local areas to give these materials to the community. So colleges, independent shop owners or allotment groups, anyone who can reuse the material so it's not either going to landfill or being wasted. The initial act of curating can also become more sustainable just by thinking about where the materials such as paint, tape and tools are sourced from whilst reducing wastage in the process of installing exhibitions. So this could be down to training staff more efficiently with tools. So there's less metal wastage in deadheading screws on their first go. A lot of equipment can be reused and reused. So jumping from the act of curation over to museum buildings, this can come in varying levels and every space is different. And I'd suggest institution management do get in touch with companies who can assist with improving buildings carbon output to get specific advice. For today though, I shall try and cover a lot, <clears throat> a lot of the ground on this. So before buildings are even built, there is an issue that architects often don't have as much conversation with their clients as they should be having. Their work often goes in their portfolios and are missing the purpose of what the building is being used for. New buildings can and should be built with efficient building fabric that doesn't allow heat in or out, which is a massive help when controlling the inside environment and storing work. This is essential when displaying and storing work. I just said that. <laughs> Of course, at the moment, natural airflow is a big issue with the pandemic. Um, however, designers aren't looking at this as a long term issue. So as soon as we can get out of this pandemic, we can look more into using the environmental energy. On new buildings and refurbing current museum spaces, there are options such as using mechanical ventilation heat recovery, MVHR and air source heat pumps to reuse the nat natural environment through electricity, which is far more efficient than gas boilers, which a lot of the buildings currently have. They can use LED lighting, if possible, dimmable. And museum specifics, they can just look at their energy and water consumption. And hopefully we can get this moving more sustainably. Um, there's also solar panels that they can put on to reduce the amount of emitting the building carbon emitted by the building. Museums can also be assessed and get certified, as I mentioned about the example earlier. So this just shows where museums are standing. It can show whether they're getting better or worse. I think there's nothing wrong with admitting you could be getting worse or you're not doing as much as you can to improve your institution. So I think getting these really puts you on the ground to explore further what you can do and the community can get involved with that as well. So last but by mo no means least, I'm going to move on to sustainable artists 
and how they practice. Two fantastic examples are Open Jar Collective and artist Hayley Harrison. So Open Jar Collective, they're a group of socially engaged artists and designers who believe artistic practices can contribute to the development of culture and the environment by sharing food, ideas and possibilities of change. They use active and creative community engagement to stage unique pop-up events, to research and hold workshops and exhibitions. Using art and food as a common language to expand, discuss and formulate how we can live more sustainably. They are based and workshop in Scotland. However, I do think their voice is expanding to the rest of the UK. Um, also, London based artist Hayley Harrison, who thankfully I've had the privilege of working with in the past. Um, she displays sustainable artwork from a sustainable practice. Part of her practice is walking and collecting found and abandoned materials from her natural environment on the streets near her studio, rural walks and on towpaths by the narrow boat where she lives. She then uses the materials poetically to question what humanity values. As an artist, Hayley states, I have a responsibility to question where my materials are coming from, the carbon footprint of my practice and how it affects other people on a practical level. I also think about the legacy of my work. For example, in the planning of a temporary installation, I think about how I can dispose of the materials in a responsible way at a later date, ending quote. Personally, I've experienced many artists thinking about their practice, practices and how they affect their carbon footprint. And I think our generation moving forwards, the artists are becoming a lot more conscious with how they are making their work and what is happening to it. Um, I think we should be working with these artists to learn from them and grow with them so that as we move into a more sustainable future together, we are all consciously thinking about our personal sector and the carbon footprint. So before I hand over to Izzy, I'd like to finish on what I see the future being like. I'm very confident and sincere when saying our generation is actively making a change in the museum sector and art is continuous continuing to respond to the world around us as long as our colleagues audiences and everyone who is part of an institution in whatever way feel and listen to the ricochet effect of those of us making an active change the museum sector can truly be a trailblazer and iconic in setting the standard for sustainability in the future over to you, Izzy. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to have to be the awkward person now that um, struggles to share my PowerPoint. Um, so give me two seconds and then I will introduce myself. OK, here we are. Um, I'm talking about museums and the climate crisis from a young activist perspective. That's me. I'm Izzy McLeod. So a little bit more about me. Um, I suppose I do three main things with my life at the moment. I'm currently studying my um, MSc in Renewable Energy and Sustainable T Technology at the University of South Wales. I work collaboratively with the Museum of Wales as an ACP or an AMGEV the Cymru um, producer, which is why I'm here. And I will explain a little bit more about that role in a second. And um, though I have some issues with this word, it does kind of describe what I do. I'm an activist. I focus on sustainability, mainly on sustainable and ethical fashion. And I've been writing about that online for more than six years now. And it's also kind of the way I got involved in working with the museum. This exhibition um, on the th um, three photos on the right and bottom are from um, an exhibition that the museum did when Dippy was on tour. Um, they worked with the Youth Forum and and young activists to create an exhibition that was about dinosaurs, extinction and fast fashion. It was essentially a dinosaur exhibition made out of old clothes, which was amazing. Um, and I wrote about that and I got an email saying, can we share this on our blog? And also, do you want to become an ACP? We weren't called ACPs back then, um, but now a year and a half on, here I am. Um, so I started my work in the museum from an activist perspective, looking at um, climate justice and sustainability. And that is not a hat that I take off. It's something that I keep within <laughs> everything I do at the museum. So a little bit more about the work that I do as an ACP. 
um, and some of the stuff that we do. So we are a group of young people. We work collaboratively with the museum, so it's quite flexible work. Sometimes we have projects that are we reach out to to see if we want to be involved in it. And sometimes we create projects of our own um, and have other ACPs involved or reach out to other members of departments. And some things that I've done is recently, I've been working with the digital and communications team to set up an Instagram for the ACPs. That's called Bloyth AC, if you wanna go and follow along with the work we're doing. This is very new, there's not much on there, but we hope to do great things with it. I've helped organize events and talks based around sustainability, um, such as the Virtually Kicking the Dust, which was about talking, young people talking to um, other people in the museum sector about sustainability, about social justice from a young perspective. I also do mutual mentoring with one of the museum directors with one other um, ACP, Abike, and there are a couple of other ACPs who do it with other museum directors. And here we look at strategy, we look at how the museum is run, we try and come up with projects together. And I'm being specifically vague about this because the projects we're working on at the moment, I'm not allowed to talk about, but hopefully you'll hear about those in due time. And I also have my dissertation project coming up in June, where I'm looking at integrating renewable energy into the Big Pit Mining Museum um, in Wales. And that, yeah, I'm excited for that, but it's not something that I've started yet. Um, so I say all this to say that I've done a lot of stuff within the museum. I work with lots of different departments, which is quite unique and quite a fun way of working. And I come at this from a sustainability perspective. So what do I think the sector can make a change for the better? I think it's about doing the work internally and externally. So here, so today we've heard about a lot of amazing exhibitions, a lot of um, places where museums are saying, this is our place in the wider world. And this is how we are helping to inspire people to make a change and helping to inspire people to learn more about the climate crisis. And I think that museums do have a huge part to play there, but I also think that they have to do the work internally um, and make systemic change within the institution to do their part in the climate change. And I kind of split this into four different areas, which I will talk about um, with some questions. It's not an exhaustive list of questions, but it's just a way to say how can you embed the climate crisis and tackling the climate crisis and sustainability into every aspect of what you do as a museum, which sounds really daunting, but I think that it's something that is a force for good, not just for the climate, but for people as well. So I'm going to go through stuff, space, funding, and also people. But when we're looking at stuff, museums have lots of stuff. that I think that's generally what people come and see. Um, lots of amazing pieces, collections, I know Chloe talks a little bit about how collections are stored, but also what happens to exhibition furniture and infrastructure after the exhibitions. Where is it sourced from? Does it all end up in a skip or is there something else that you can be looking to do with it? What materials are you using for outreach and education, especially if that outreach and education is looking at the climate crisis? You know, are you leading by example in that way? What's being sold in your shops and cafes? So are you encouraging people to be careful about their consumption? Um, are you sourcing food locally? Is there unnecessary plastic on the things that you're selling? And how is water and waste managed, managed across sites? Um, and of course, this can be really different depending on what type of museum you are, but these are some things to consider with regards to stuff. And then we have space, which again, Chloe um, did cover about are spaces being built for purpose? Are they designed in a low carbon way? Are they being utilized well? and how are they powered? And also, how can they be more energy efficient? In the UK especially, we have some of the worst insulated buildings in Europe, um, and that has a massive effect on emissions, but also on money. So here you can save money as well as saving on your emissions. And if you have outdoor spaces, are they utilised well? Do they encourage biodiversity and learning? Are there ways to incorporate things like community gardens um, and that sort of thing into outdoor spaces as well? And then we get onto funding, which I know can be a controversial topic, and we heard a bit about this this morning, but who is funding your museum and your exhibitions, and do they have ties to industries that are contributing to the climate crisis? And if they do, do you have a plan on how to divest from those industries, or how to work with, I suppose, more ethical, I would say, <laughs> industries? 
And when you have that funding, is it used to properly compensate those that you're working for, especially if you're working with smaller community groups and young people and people that aren't often engaged in museum works necessarily. And then finally, onto people. Um, so we're looking at who museums are made by and for, how are you engaging people and how are they being enabled to make positive change within your museum? Are you listening to criticism that people um, are giving you? Is that being built upon? As I said, with the funding, are your opportunities that you're having compensated and accessible? Um, part of the reason I can do the work that I do as an ACP is because um, we have conversations about how to properly compensate young people, which I think as in a lot of sectors, we're not necessarily valued for the work we do. And we're not necessarily paid in a way that is equitable. And so I'm very grateful that in my job, we have conversations about compensation and pay and how we properly compensate people for the work that they're doing. And are these accessible? Also, do staff have access to knowledge and training on sustainability? If you have individuals within your organization who can say, I can make a change myself, that makes everyone's life easier. So is that skill, are those skills available? Um, can people learn them? And also, is it easy for visitors to make sustainable choices when visiting? I am quite a climate conscious person. And I know if I walk into a space where there's single use plastic everywhere and I can't make sustainable choices, it frustrates me. Can I walk into a space and just go, ah, this is not something I have to think about. It's being done for me. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a whirlwind tour through those things as I have limited time right now. But I want to finally then, um, oh, I forgot this slide was here. <laughs> so yeah, there's no one thing that makes a museum sustainable as it's something that happens through every piece of what you do. And it's not one statement or a single exhibition that you put on, it's about continuous action. And it's about working to change systems for the good of people and for the planet. Um, and I want to end this just again focusing on young people because I don't think you need me to tell you that young people are at the forefront of climate activism and climate justice um, and really want to do the work here and so giving opportunities to young people to do that work helps them grow and learn and do what they want to do but it also helps museums learn and grow and do what they want to do. I am continually inspired by the work that other ACPs are doing and that I'm able to get involved with, with working with the Museum of Wales. Do I think the museum is perfect? No, but the work that I'm getting involved in really inspires me. And I think giving people that opportunity to share and learn and grow helps everyone. And that is where I'm going to finish. I will hand over to Kate. Thank you, Izzy. Um, hi, so my name's Kate. Um, so just a little brief summary about myself. Um, I graduated from my MA in anthropology in 2019, although I didn't get a graduation in 2020. We all know why. Um, and then since then, I've just been really trying to work and gain a lot of experience so I can try and break into my chosen career field. Um, in 2019, I had the opportunity to be an in, uh, intern on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation in South Dakota, which was by far one of the best experiences of my life. And then this year, I've had the opportunity to work as an ACP um, on the LAMCAM project with St. Fagan, so that's Museum Wales. I know Izzy's already touched on what an ACP is, so I won't go into that. Um, so the LAMCAM project basically live streams the lamb in sheds at St. Fagan's 24 seven for the duration of the project. Um, it's really, really popular. We've got a lot of loyal super fans. Um, and then, so my role within that project was to basically control the cameras and try and catch the action as it happens, and then to create some digital content and learning materials. Um, so LAMCAM this year has moved entirely online. Um, in the past, schools have been able to attend the, um, the, the site itself, meet the sheep in person and do some workshops and activities. Um, so obviously due to the pandemic, the workshops and activities have now moved to digital platforms. So one thing that really struck me about this was that many museums are now having to adapt um, and change and move to digital platforms to engage with and showcase their exhibitions with the audiences. So I think in doing this, they're creating 
um, what can be seen as a more sustainable and accessible form of engagement. Obviously, you've got the less greenhouse gas emissions from visitors driving to and from the site itself, less waste being generated on site, and also less le energy is being used. Um, there are, however, some definite downfalls to this. Obviously, it's really nice to be able to go to the site and immerse yourself in the full sensory experience, but there are some pros and cons that we can think about. And I think one of the most interesting things that we could look at post-pandemic is the ways in which the global community have collectively responded to, um, to the pandemic and whether this could then inspire us um, to form new ways of collective climate action and to facilitate that. So I think moving exhibitions, events and engagement projects online makes museums more accessible as well as more sustainable. So from my experience with the LAMCAM project, in past years, the schools have been able to come, obviously engage, meet the sheep, see the cute lambs. But now this is all online. Obviously the live stream's always been online, but the the activities themselves are already there on the website. So people can now go on, download the pack and, be able, and do it straight from the internet, which I think is good because a lot of people might not be able to travel to St. Fagans. Um, so it's given that, that reach the audience, um, it's far and wide. Um, what is interesting to consider is whether this um, may be a per more permanent part of museum participation after all museums have reopened and um, and if so, how they can improve on their digital platforms and what this might look like, maybe some VR headsets. I think that would be pretty cool. Um, so today more than ever, there is a need to talk about climate change and sustainability. We all have an obligation to ensure that we are doing our part to become more sustainable. As museums are a continued source of education and engagement with communities, it's clear to see we need to keep trying to educate and engage with people on sustainability and climate change issues uh, and also leading by example i know izzy and chloe have already touched on this but we need to showcase what we're doing from a top-down approach so we're, we're not just preaching it we're doing it as well um, technology can allow museums to become more sustainable and let the new evolve from the existing these um, these changes can then allow museums to present themselves in new light, capture new audiences. And I think by doing this, you can then create a global dialogue. Like this conference is amazing. There's so many people from around the world. And I think that is so cool. And then everyone can share in what they're doing and what works for them or maybe what doesn't work for them so well. Um, we are seeing more and more globally that young people are at the forefront and are being the driving force of sustainable and climate change movements, like Izzy and Chloe have mentioned already. Um, so for my master's uh, research, I looked specifically at the um, how young people are engaging in climate change and sustainability movements. I also looked at um, consumption patterns. And one thing that I found was quite interesting was those that were engaged within these movements would quite often look at a brand or an institute and if they were con contributing to environmental degradation, degradation or they had stakeholders that were supporting companies that did just that, they would remove their support and then also tell others why they should do the same and most of the time on open online platforms. So I think again, the museum really need, museums really need to look at that and make sure that they are leading by example. Governments and institutes such as museums can learn a lot from these movements by channeling the energy and passion that these activists have into helping create st strategies for change. Um, again, back to the youth as well, by creating youth forums and engagement projects such as Museum Wales has, has done with the ACPs, um, museums can welcome in a new wave of sustainable thinking and hear from those who are not afraid to challenge the existing strategies that they think are not working. Um, I also, I think, in my own opinion, needs to be more input, input from those that are that have grown up with climate change worries, um, because I think they would have a different perspective to those that have not grown up in this context. Excuse me, hay fever. Um, another way that museums can make more sustain, uh, more can be become more sustainable would be to allow climate change and sustainability messages 
um, to be carried through to the gift shop and cafes as well. So allowing the visitors to connect with and participate in um, what's being displayed in the museum with regards to the exhibitions on climate change, actually when they go to the cafe and the gift shop, linking the two together. Um, this can be achieved by using local producers. This will reduce the carbon footprint and also showcase local creativity. With this being said, I know Izzy's already mentioned this, sustainable consumption is often seen as a luxury. Um, more often than not, you'll go to a retailer and they've all, all sell sustainable, non-sustainable products at the same time. Sometimes the non-sustainable choice is the cheaper choice. So I think museums could benefit from only selling sustainable products. It makes that choice for consumer a lot easier then. Um, moving on to social media, I think that this offers a great opportunity for museums to communicate, interact and engage with their audience. This has been seen within the LAMCAM project. Engagement is great. Everyone loves LAMCAM. Everyone's on Twitter talking about it. Um, and the comments section, so where the live stream is, you've got comments underneath. There's so many super fans every year that come in and want to know about the sheep. They want to ask questions. They have worries about maybe a sheep is not, not stood up for a while. So they pop in and ask their questions and they get them answered straight away um, by the experts, which is great. And I think um, that builds on the interaction and sharing of information between the museum and participant. Um, I think by opening communications and allowing the audience to, to participate within the virtual space, not only allows museums to then start a conversation about sustainability, but also increase their access. I know that um, some of the comments that we were having about LAMCAM were from the US and Holland, so I think it really does work. Um, not everyone is able to vis visit the museum physically, so having that virtual space with the open, open forum um, then allows people to engage in conversation that they would have, uh, they, so they're not losing out on that. Because I think when you visit the museum, you get to talk to people that work there and really engage. So I think that would help. Um, another way that museums can promote sustainable consumption is by doing something such as seed banks or community gardens. Um, so where they, you can grow food as a community. So when I worked um, on the Cheyenne River Reservation, one of the charity's main projects was um, the, uh, the construction of this community garden. It was really amazing. And then um, one of the local community members would teach anyone that came how to grow food sustainably themselves. Um, and then you can also take, the, take what you needed from the harvest as well. Um, I think something like this could potentially be implemented in the grounds of museums. I think that would be a great way to connect with community as well. Um, museums can help make a difference, taking on the role of agents of social change. Um, and I think one of the main ways we need to um, look at doing this is by making sure that all voices in all communities are being heard and are part of the discussion around sustainability. There is much that can be learned, for example, from the perspective of indigenous communities. Um, we can do this by showcasing exhibitions and works from Indigenous activists and artists centralised on sustainability. This can open up a dialogue about not only the past, but the current environmental impacts of climate change on Indigenous communities and how these are perpetuated by governments. So when I was, um, again, on the um, Shire River Reservation, I had the great opportunity to meet uh, quite a few activists and artists, and a lot of their work was really surrounding climate change and things like the Dakota pipeline access. Um, and I think that's important because this then raises further awareness of environmental and social issues that are impacting them today. So that being said, I think sadly that um, those who are contributing least to the problem of climate change will unfortunately suffer the most from its impacts. So I do think that we need to think about the ways we can change and start acting on that today. Sorry, I feel like I flew through that, but. <laughs> Amazing, thank you, Kate. So now um, we're into the Q and A part of our session. and I'm just gonna get some questions up. Um, the first one, um, I'm going to aim this at Chloe first, as it was asked during her um, talk, is um, do you find that you have the opportunities to suggest these changes in different ways of sourcing materials to move um, to more senior members of staff? If so, are they receptive to that, those um, suggestions? Yes, I do personally. I think I'm extremely 
um, grateful that where I work within, I think a month of being there, I'd had a one-to-one -one with my manager and just said everything that I wanted to change and things that I could see that still need to be um, sort of looked at. Um, they were extremely receptive and they're extremely, as I said, sort of in my talk, they're very proactive. So um, they were very much like, take this job role and make it your own and any changes you want to do. Um, they were extremely well received. I think for things that are far more structurally um, demanding, um, like changing from gas boilers over to using the environmentals um, to create energy through the electricity, um, that's a much bigger ask. So I think using um, new energy is much more, easy is not the right word, but if you're creating a new building, it's something that can be put into conversation and you can build almost like the perfect building as you'd like. Um, but yeah, so I'm very lucky where I am. I think they're very actively moving forwards to making change. I think, unfortunately, that's not the case for every institution. Um, but I do think as um, with the three of us, we're all sort of in our early 20s, early career professionals. Um, we have that drive and that mission to kind of be like, we can see issues. We want to make this change rather than um, a sort of pussy footing around the question. Um, We've kind of worked, I think, being in the art sector, um, we've worked many sort of unsecure jobs before we've got secure work um, that we're more than happy to kind of voice, voice our issues, um, knowing that change is happening. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that from where I am, because I know that within strategy um, planning and other sectors within the Museum of Wales, they actively look to involve ACP voices in that, especially now they want at least one of us there to give our opinion on what's happening. And I would say that with my meetings with the director of the museum, um, one of the directors, she often says to me and Abika who I work with um, that we are very good at keeping her to task and we often ask questions that maybe other staff members are um, nervous to ask or wouldn't bring up because we are not scared of necessarily I don't know we're just not scared <laughs> we just come in because um, the work that I do as an ACP is sort of freelance so I'm just here this is what I see this is what I think's um, gonna change or needs to change and yeah they're pretty receptive and I think I'm pretty lucky with that as well. Did you have anything to add to that Kate? Yeah I was just gonna say that um, personally I think it's really hard if you're um, in a job role that you've been in for 20 plus years um, often if you you will know that something is not working or that you could improve on it and do better especially in the sustainable front um, but sometimes you don't you don't know how to approach that and you don't know how to say it and then I think that's how it's that's why it's good to bring in that new wave of sustainable thinking with the younger people and get them to you know pop in see what they think about it they might have some different ideas um, and different you know strategies that you might have never thought of so yeah agree um, another question I've got here which I think is linked um, is as emerging professionals what would support you in, um, what would support the development of your careers and what would be your key ask? Um, I think I'll start off this um, by saying what I said earlier. First of all, it's being listened to and feeling like your opinions are valued, like being actively listened to when you make a suggestion. You can say no if you don't believe my suggestion's good, but that active listening is important and having feedback on that, but then also proper compensation because um, as Chloe said, a lot of us have worked insecure jobs or we've worked jobs of very low pay or we're not valued and having proper compensation really shows that our work is being valued and that we're being listened to and I think that's the big thing for me is that value there. Yeah I completely agree I think we are in lucky positions where we are getting compensated fairly for the work we're doing however before you kind of get into that position it's almost expected within the industry um, that you will volunteer or you'll intern for free 
Um, and a lot of the time, these can be quite demanding hours, which then mean if you are working part time jobs outside of this, um, you're quite pressured as to where you need to put your time. Obviously, a lot of um, people have like rent to pay, bills to pay. They have outgoings that need to be funded. However, obviously, we all have dreams and a mission to um, work within the art sector. And if we're not then being funded for the work we're doing, um, I do think a lot of young people have to make the difficult decision as to where they then see their career path going. If they're not being um, funded by the work, like recompensed um, for what they're doing, um, they need to then look at where they will get paid. Um, unfortunately, it is kind of money focused, um, but you do have to pay for stuff. Yeah, I agree. And I think for me as well, especially um, since finishing my master's, um, I've really struggled trying to break into the cultural heritage sector, which is where I see myself. And I've been trying to do all these different experiences that will make me stand out, but I, it's a, still, again, a struggle. And the way I found out about the ACP um, projects was by actually applying for a job in the museum that I did not get um, because I didn't have the experience. And then, so I think the AC pro ACP projects are good because they do get, get you ha um, let you have that experience, but at the same time, they are one-offs. So for me, I've just finished this LAMCAM project and I am working two part-time jobs um, with out of the sector, just trying to get by but at the same time continuously applying for every job that the museum offers um, and I think again it's just you know you you need experience for these jobs but how are you supposed to get the experience if you can't get the job so I, I think that yeah I think there just needs to be more focus on that but it's so hard especially with the pandemic because you've got so many people applying for these jobs that are so overqualified so then it's hard for, for a younger person to compete with that but yeah, sorry. I'm Just going to off on add on to that. Yeah, I think um, once you've got that job security, um, people stay in their jobs because they're in a sector that they love working in. And of course, they're not going to leave. They're going to move up the ladder and they're going to want to stay um, within what they're doing. Um, so I think, yeah, it could kind of maybe be a case of creating more roles for sort of early career professionals. So there's more of a chance to actually getting in the sector um, rather than, because my um, situation was exactly the same, apply for different roles and then you get um, a different role to get the experience and eventually you do get the job that you want. Um, but yeah, I think sort of maybe creating more job roles for sort of early um, either school leavers or uni leavers is quite important. Yeah, I definitely think that because one conversation I have a lot is how do you get different people into the museum sector? Like people have, are asking me that and it's sort of a lot of the time people don't necessarily see themselves in a lot of job roles in the museum or they'll go to people already with the previous experience. So I think it's getting that initial bit of experience that is not does not have to be an unpaid internship or volunteering, that there's some roles there that are paid opportunities to do work because it's not like we're not valuable in the work that we do just because we don't have a secure job yet um so yeah i need to find another question now <laughs> um i'll go for this one this is quite a difficult one i think but um how long does it take for a medium-sized museum to come become fully sustainable and green and i might just start this one off by saying i don't think there is such a thing as the fully sustainable green stamp I think, as I said, it's about continuous work and we're going to we're always learning about sustainability and I guess greenness. And I don't know if there's that ultimate end goal that you go, OK, now we're sustainable. Now you're green. Of course, you can make steps to become more green. But um, I think that it's about focusing on the work that you're doing rather than the end goal. Maybe <laughs> anyone else? I completely agree. I don't have anything more to add to that. I think that, yeah. Yeah, same to be honest. I think as long as you're putting in the work and you know what your goal is and you know that you're trying, I think that's that's the most important thing. Um, yeah, I think we'll get there eventually. And I think 
part of that would might be technology you know technology is always improving and there's so many different things that we can gain from that especially with you know these like buildings that are computers but also catch the rain and do all these crazy things that are amazing and sustainable so maybe that's the future Yes, I have a great question from earlier. It was asked in the um, session with Nick, Mary and Natalie um, and that um, with an exhibition in 2050 on a look back at how we responded to the climate change, what object would we like to see in that collection? Um, Kate, do you want to start us off on that one? Oh, sorry, you're having trouble. Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, so um, there's a look into the future in 2050 at an exhibition that looks back, I'm wording this badly, <laughs> that looks back um, on how we've tackled the climate change, assuming we have by 2050. What is one object that you would want to see in that exhibition? Shall I come back? Do you need a second? <laughs> Chloe? I'll happily. Um, so a specific object, I probably couldn't describe, like tell you like a specific box or a specific material, um, but I think it would be extremely interesting to see how work that has been made by artists who practice sustainability um, sustainably has aged. So I think a lot of the materials that they're using, um, the work might look exactly the same. Um, so for certain materials that aren't decomposing and it'll prove an element of the fact that hopefully by 2050 we'll have changed a lot of these materials and they're not materials that we use in daily life anymore. Um, so it'll be quite a nice like nostalgic look. This is what sort of our landfills could be filled with. Thankfully, they're not anymore. Um, well, they will be, but not as much in the next like 40 years. Um, but we have this sort of piece of art that will last for a long time, um, sort of with sad reflections, but positive sort of views moving forwards. Um, but then I think it'll be interesting to see how materials might have changed. I think a lot of work might not exist um, if they're using sort of land art or natural products or produce and materials. Um, these things will decompose. And I think that's really nice that that's gonna be part of a lot of artists practice um, that a lot of the work might not be object based, it might be maybe archive based, and we can view it in sort of a different, maybe more futuristic way. Amazing. Kate, do you have an object in mind yet? Or do you still need <laughs> a second? Still pondering it. It's such a good question. <laughs> um, I'll go and I think it's not so much an object, but I think if um, museums do make a change to the way that they view exhibitions and exhibition infrastructure, that we could have pieces that are, re if, especially if you're looking at how museums have tackled the climate change the crisis, you have pieces that have been made from museum pieces. So how these things have been used and reused and recycled and reused, and what has that become? What has that piece that was originally in an exhibition become eventually? And what life cycles has it gone through to create art or to create other structures? Um, I think that would be really interesting. Now you're on the spot, Kate. <laughs> There's just so many. Um, maybe just like a really basic thing that's just become like it's everywhere now, paper straws. Like, they're everywhere, but then you've got the metal straws now. So maybe in 50 years time, they'll be invisible. No, not invisible, but like mechanical straws that are made from grass and things. I don't know, it's crazy. There's, there's too many options. Yeah, I think it's almost hard to imagine 2050 because part of me is like, will we get there in terms of just be looking back and not still be tackling things but part of me is like no I really hope we are and I want to see how we look at I guess because someone said there's a great tweet that's like oh no I just realized there's going to be a museum interactive in 50 years where you participate in a 2020 zoom call to understand the pandemic <laughs> yeah that that would be weird um so another question we have here which I think is Another difficult one is um, I get the point about fossil fuel not being the flavour of the month, but um, what do we do with Middle Eastern slash 
gulf areas um, where oil is the only business in terms of funding museums i don't necessarily have an answer for this but i think my point would be looking at having a plan for divestment um, or how you move away from that because you might not see the options right now but it doesn't mean there's nothing there and just saying okay we're putting together a plan we're looking at other options is better than nothing i think i don't know yeah i agree so i don't have the experience or expertise to say what they should or shouldn't be doing but it's definitely an option that you can use the facilities that you have to then create new jobs and create new ways of doing things um so you can look at what they have and what they're using um retrain workers to build sort of different ways of using what they have and hopefully internationally we can all kind of develop um to grow together obviously as uh globally we all sit in different sort of levels of what we can do but it's kind of we can learn from each other and we'll move at our own pace towards the same goal maybe not at the same speed but it's about sort of continuous continually moving forwards really yeah i agree to be honest um i think eventually things like fossil fuels are, there's not going to be anything left so i think we do need to progress towards sustainable resources but yeah it is hard especially when that is the main um resource of that specific land um so yeah i think it's a really good question but i don't have all the answers for that one i'm sorry yep I, yeah, definitely a difficult one. Um, and as we're coming towards the end, I think I'll finish with sort of one last question. And I'll start this one off with Kate, is how do you see the museum landscape, I guess, changing in terms of incorporating the digital and the physical in the future as we've gone pretty much completely digital for the last year? Um, yeah, I think it'll be interesting. I think it'll be um, quite exciting to see what uh, museums will do with it. Um, I think it's definitely going to be like a hybrid of the two. Uh, I don't think it's going to just move completely digital um, and there's going to be no physical sites whatsoever. But I think definitely improving on digital platforms would be a good start so that at least if you're physically not able to visit the museum, you can still have the full experience from your home. Um, like VR, VR headsets, I still think that would be so cool. Oh, sorry. But yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to see. Sorry, I'm trying to uh, stay under time. That's fine. Chloe? Same view, really. I think it's going to be a really nice um, sort of merge of the digital and the physical, opening up um, artworks and collections to the wider community. So for people who can't visit, um, they can see and experience exhibitions um, in be it a different way to physically being able to see artwork. Um, but I think hopefully maybe more funding might go into sort of video equipment or audio tours, um, which can be experienced on site, put in archives that could help with um, storage solutions, um, but also have that audio um, sort of messages put on websites and put online as well. Yeah, I'd agree. And I think also in terms of working, I would like to see more of a mix because from my role, well, I, I started off pre-pandemic with the museum doing a bit here and there. And it was always a little bit difficult as someone from the outside to get in and join meetings and that sort of thing. But because of it being all on Zoom, I've been able to hop from a lecture into a meeting with the museum and then do some work for either. And it's just made everything, okay, I wish I wasn't stuck in my room all day every day, but it has made certain things more accessible and has made me being able to get more involved in more work. And as was said earlier, people have been able to collaborate across the world in different ways because they've been online and people haven't had to travel for conferences, which is a plus and a minus in many ways. So yeah, I definitely like to see a mix of the two. Going Just forward. quickly adding on to that, I think it will be quite a good way to um, 
explore work opportunities for people trying to get into um, the sector. So if they don't need to physically be on site, but can do um, sort of work with teams online, um, I think that's sort of a possibility that it could be a cheaper way for institutions to employ people whilst also being able to fund um, the younger people's um, time. Amazing. So I think I will pass over to Kate to end the session here. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you all so much for listening. It's been amazing. Such a great experience. Thank you all for engaging and asking us such great questions as well. Um, and if any of you do want to reach out to us to get a bit more information or anything, you can contact ICOM and they'll um, pass you our way. So thank you again. Thank you so much, um, Chloe, Izzy and Kate, for, for sharing uh, your thoughts. Um, hang on, I'm trying to get myself organised here. So this, um, sorry, thank you. This, this was really, really inspirational and it was great timekeeping too. In, um, in response to some questions, just a quick reminder that the film about sustainable museums uh, around the world from this afternoon will be available on the Barker Langham Instagram TV account uh, later on tonight, I believe. Now I'd like to sum up the day and what I think we learned today. This morning, the conversation between Nick Merriman, Natalie Bennett and Mary Robinson about the role museums can play in reaching net zero emissions an increase in biodiversity sparked a considerable discussion about the audience too. Natalie shared her observation that there is, net, <clears throat> that there is now broad agreement among scientists, politicians and the public that we need to stay below 1.5 degrees average warming if we want to avoid the worst impacts of global climate change, some of which are felt by many communities around the world already. It is no longer being denied that the dangerous changes to the global climate are the result of human, of human actions. Hence, what we do as humans affects what will happen next. Mary expressed that, that she does not believe a techno technological approach will get us where we need to be. Instead, she thinks that any changes that we make need to be both top down from governments as well as bottom up by communities. This involves museums acting as thought leaders. Museums need to spell out how it is and be vocal about the situation we're facing, meaning that the message needs to be evident, not in individual exhibitions, but the moment people walk into the museum. Nick indicated that traditionally museums operate in broadcast mode, which includes the danger of being quite, quite a passive approach. Perhaps out of anxiety of losing a perceived neutrality and the trust which museums have in the public. Is it possible for museums to be activist yet, ap yet apolitical? The response from Mary was that museums should not be neutral, but not being neutral does not necessarily mean being political. Natalie reminded us that art frequently is very political. Museums document societal changes and this includes the changes currently happening. The question of sponsorship of museums arose as well, and Natalie felt strongly that the museum sector had received a terrible deal in the past, whereas some corporate, corporate organizations got a very good deal by greenwashing the otherwise dirty activities through giving money to museums. Mary indicated that there's now considerable leadership on environmental issues from the private sector, including some quite radical thinking on climate change with some corporate organizations no longer serving shareholders but placing more emphasis on stakeholders. In that sense, there are new opportunities emerging for museums to find new partners and sponsors in the private sector. On the, on the issue of individual action, Natalie outlined an example from a German train she rode on recently and could not see a single item of single-use plastic, but that most museum cafes still featured lots of them and she urged museums to be braver in their decisions. Mary explained that there are three things everyone can do. Take personal responsibility for the climate crisis in their personal lives, 
get angry and become active and rot, and imagine the new world we are hurrying towards. Especially the latter point is where museums can play an important role by working with their communities and using their skills to display a new world vision. What I personally took from this session is encouragement that politicians are willing museums to be part of the solution, actually seeing museums as instrumental in mitigating the climate crisis. I want to leave the question in the room whether we as the sector perhaps have been too cautious, too anxious about potentially upsetting our sponsors or communities, and whether sticking our necks out can actually be extremely rewarding for our communities and our planet. Not wanting to single out any, anyone else, one particularly positive example is perhaps the approach by the Australian Museum, who are very open about their responsibilities and active on many levels. The second session led by my fellow ICOM UK committee member Claire Messenger in conjunction with Nadine Panayot, who spoke to us live from Beirut, provided a deeply emotional insight into the history of the Archaeological Museum at the American University of Beirut especially the terrible aftermath of last year's explosion in the port of Beirut, which destroyed much of the city. The devastation caused by the explosion resulted in the loss of many lives. And despite the destruction of hundreds of objects in the museum, Nadine explained how the human tragedy around them put the loss of objects into perspective. The disaster response at the museum concentrated initially on securing the building's doors and windows, and the painstaking salvage of items fractured into many pieces. There were audible cheers of joy in the film when two goblets were recovered intact. When the focus shifted to saving collections, students were an important part of a first aid rescue team, whilst other agencies looked at repairing the buildings. The museum received much support from the local community as well as specialist help from the international museum community. Despite the de devastation, the museum maintained a program of events, including lectures and tours. One major change for the museum was the recognition of the digital sphere as a distinct branch of museum events programming, which is, I think, something that um, many of us um, will find familiar in the past 12 months. Nadine struck me as being incredibly positive in the face of disaster. She says, she recognizes the many barriers for visitors entering the museum because people must first enter the campus of the university and then the museum. And she would like to make it easier for the local community to come and see their heritage. Nadine reminded us that cultural resources are now recognized as improving quality of life. Natural and cultural heritage preservation is inherent in the sustainable development goals. We have therefore no choice other than to preserve and engage, bring people together, and prompt individual and collective action. The film was a powerful lesson in how many different possible solutions there are within the museum community to the complex problem of climate change. After lunch, we saw a film prepared by Barker Langham about how many museums around the world, how many museums around the world respond to climate change. The diversity of responses was exhilarating and they were coming in thick and fast from all continents and as far as field as Alaska, Panama, Cape Town, Qatar, Greece, Hong Kong, Australia and Vanuatu. Museums tell stories and any object can tell the story of climate change. By extension, any museum can become a climate change museum. We heard how climate change displaces people and what the negative feedbacks are on climate of people being displaced a formidable negative feedback loop. We also heard examples of sustainable architecture and museum practice. Museums ensured that community voices are heard and encourage visitors to take home messages about whose responsibility climate change is. There were examples of how climate change will and does affect communities and their heritage. Museums definitely are a diverse platform for change. In the final session of the day, we heard from three early career professionals who discussed what developing positive change can look like in the museum sector. Chloe, Izzy and Kate informed us of practical ways in which museums through their own operations can contribute to mitigating climate change, whilst also promoting sustainable living practices through their learning programs. Izzy told us about her work as climate justice activist based at Angiatha Cymru 
not museum wells. Museums need to make systemic changes within the institution before being able to inspire people to learn about the climate crisis, a very important point. This means looking in detail at museum operations, resource use, energy use, and use of exhibition materials. Kate worked on the Lamb Camp project, with, which films life as they lamb at St. Fagans National History Museum of Wales on the outskirts of Cardiff, which is an example of participation for people who cannot travel to the museum. Chloe and Kate reminded us that young people are at the forefront of driving changes in museums, a very nice link back to this morning's discussion on social justice. Young people have grown up with climate change anxieties and now demand the change much louder than my generation did when we were young. I was pretty loud on the subject when I was young, but it was more difficult to be heard in those days than it is now. We've really come a very long way in the past 30 years. I find it very encouraging to see that young people do not linger on blaming older generations for the mess we now find ourselves in, but are actively working towards achieving the improvements we desperately need. Their experience is that senior members of staff are receptive to, to suggestions for change, although some of this depends on the size of the ask. Large financial investments seem to require more persuasion. Importantly, there is no green end goal. Sustainable develop, development is about a process of continuous improvements. So in summary, what do museums have to do with climate change? The dire environmental constraints we observe today remind us of the notion that continuous growth is essential to well-being is entirely preposterous. There are clearly limits to growth and museums must consider how invasive economic, current economic models are. Sustainable development is about doing the work to move to a more sustainable society and mitigating, if not averting climate change. It is comforting to talk about making the world a better place for everyone, yet success comes down to our ability to take action. Amazingly, there seems to be wide agreement that museums must play an active role in this. Museums have plenty of opportunities to take action. We've seen and heard many examples today and heard some powerful, insightful and persuasive arguments why they should. And museum professionals at all levels can play their part in achieving this change. If this means being activist, then museums are activist. But it is important that our work is rooted in the needs of our local communities. I'm simply blown away by how many positive examples and thoughts and ideas for addressing climate change and sustainable development that are already in our global museum community. Museums really lead by example, and this is something we can all build upon. This gives me much hope for the future. It remains for me to thank our partners, the National Museum Directors Council, the British Council and Barker Langham Cultural Consultancy for their help in devising this conference. Our speakers for their generosity of time and commitment for sharing their important work and thoughts and you, the audience, for taking the time to participate actively in the discussions today. You've been amazing and I'm glad but thanks to technology, the vast distances covered by all were no obstacle. As far as I could see, we had participants from Australia, North America, and all over Europe, and probably many other places that I've missed. I hope you enjoyed the day as much as I did. Please do send us some feedback. Tomorrow's